started. Um, first, I'm going to give a quick overview of our uh, agenda for today, and um, then we'll dive right in. Um, first, we're going to have a quick administrative update from Tom. Then we will have a panel discussion and deliberation from what we uh, heard from yesterday. Uh, our third item will be uh, public comment. After public, public comment, we'll have a discussion and vote on uh, death penalty recommendations. Um, before we get started, however, uh, I want to make a, a statement or um, I just want to say something about um, some testimony from one of our panelists, Mike Reynolds, yesterday. Um, in my opinion, he made some remarks that perpetuated racist stereotypes that were um, incorrect, uh, harmful actually to this committee, some of its members, the state, and certainly to a rational conversation about improving our penal code. Um, Professor Ochin called out these remarks immediately, and I regret not having done so uh, at the time myself, um, especially given that it was Professor Ochin's first uh, meeting with us. Of course, the committee wants to hear from a full cross section of ideas and perspectives around the state, um, but that doesn't mean those ideas shouldn't be questioned and challenged in real time. Uh, as chair of this committee uh, for which racial justice is a core concern, uh, I, I pledge to do better. And so I just wanted to state that for the record. And if anybody else has anything that they'd like to say about this, um, I'd like to hear from you. I'd like to uh, speak on this. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Romano. You know, this committee is fundamentally charged with uh, simplifying and rationalizing the substance of criminal law and ensuring that it's just and equitable. As you said, um, Mike, uh, yesterday we heard testimony from a witness um, who was called by this committee, whose viewpoints were given a platform by this committee, who relied on racial stereotypes and historical uh, racist associations between criminality and blackness uh, to defend, frankly, what I think is indefensible. Uh, three strikes, LWAP, and other extreme sentences that have devastated uh, black and brown communities and quite insultingly arguing that these were in the best interests of black and brown communities. This is the antithesis of this committee's charge. Uh, this kind of racial fear mongering and stereotyping is precisely what led uh, to what Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls the biggest prison building project in the history of the world. One of the largest carceral populations in the world and a system that relies on the largest uh, budget uh, and spending on policing in prison, not only in the country, but in the world. I hope that my colleagues going forward will join me in rejecting this kind of logic in our policy making. Um, it cannot be given quarter anywhere, but particularly in law. Uh, the people of California deserve better. Uh, this committee deserves better, and I hope that the committee will deliver better uh, through our recommendations, through our deliberations, and through our final report and recommendations to the legislature. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the time to uh, address this uh, matter, uh, Chair Romano. Thank you. Judge Espinosa, did you want to say something? I did. I, I wanted to um, join in uh, Professor Ochin's comments. I was thankful that she jumped in in real time to address what was being said. I will say in the defense of the committee, Professor Ochin, that um, I was stunned at what I heard. And it's, we've heard from a, a variety of sources on a variety of issues. And that's the first time we've ever received testimony quite like that. Um, and so I, I, I don't want you to walk away with the impression, as you put it, that we give quarter to, to um, that sort of ideology in the work that we do here. In fact, again, I was very surprised and, and thankful that you were um, in your first meeting, uh, quite frankly, willing to jump in and, and um, call out the ideologies that were being expressed. And I, I thought you did a good job. Thank you. Unless anybody else has anything to say on this, we can um, move on. All right, I hope that we can all move on uh, and learn and um, do better. So thank you, Professor Ochin and uh, Judge Espinoza. Um, all right, so first uh, item of business is an administrative update. I'm gonna hand the reins over to, to Tom. 
Yes, thanks, Mike. This will be very quick. Uh, three quick points. Uh, first, I'm happy to report that our partners at the California Policy Lab, uh, who are going to be um, the big brains we have doing a lot of our data work for us, are hiring staff who are coming on board to start some of that work. So it's been a long time coming, but uh, it's starting to be a little more concrete. Uh, the second thing is, as Mike mentioned yesterday, we do have uh, one more vacancy on the committee that the um, governor is seeking to fill. So I just wanted to point that out again. And the third thing is, and I think um, we just got confirmation this morning in the budget is we are expecting to hire two more attorneys soon. So anyone who is watching or on the committee who has uh, thoughts on who might be good, if you're interested in that position, please keep an eye on our webpage or get in touch with me or anyone on staff. And uh, we're happy to keep you updated. Um, we got a lot of work, so we need the help. That's all I've got, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Does anybody have any questions on administrative issues? Nope. All right, we're, we're especially grateful to the legislature and the governor to continue to fund and support uh, the committee. Uh, I, I wanna say that our staff has really done an insane amount of work, um, really shorthanded. And we've also been uh, fortunate to be staffed in part by philanth with philanthropic support, which you know, a government agency really shouldn't have to depend on philanthropic support in order to do its work. Um, but we have, but the, and, and, the, and the point being is that um, everybody's been doing, you know, above and beyond work and it'll be great to have the extra, extra hands. So um, thanks to those who made that happen. Okay, um, moving on to a discussion on the substance of yesterday's hearing. So I wanted to run through some of the ideas that came up based on yesterday's conversation, the ideas that see, sort of seem to raise, rise to the top based on our conversation and staff materials. And the goal of this part of our conversation is not necessarily, not, not at all to come up with uh, committee recommendations, but instead to sort of prioritize uh, further research and, al and analysis uh, for committee staff uh, to eventually work up possible proposals. So the ideas, I'll just list them off as the ones that in my mind rose to the top, um, and then we can go back and discuss, plus any others that uh, I may have missed, was some kind of uh, what I'll call a second look for LWAP sentences, um, reducing the 1020 life um, gun enhancement rule, reducing or eliminating the three strikes law, uh, a 20 year cap on sentences with uh, perhaps a civil commitment possibility at the tail end, expanding Proposition 57 parole to apply to not just, to more than just nonviolent, uh, people who commit nonviolent crimes. And then uh, there was a short discussion about hate crimes. So those were the ideas that sort of seemed to percolate to the top for me. I don't know if there are any others, but well, we can come back. Um, so let, just going back to the top of my list uh, that I said there, I was curious what people thought uh, about the, the LWAP second look proposal. I was particularly surprised. I, I will say that our, um, our guest, our witness, um, two things. First of all, she came at extraordinarily late notice. So uh, I just wanna thank her and grateful to her. Um, but she uh, is the president of the WDA's Association of Los Angeles County, which is probably more conservative than the DA's association itself, the political stands that it takes. Um, and I was surprised at her uh, apparent openness to some kind of at least a judicial second look for life without parole sentences, if not an outright ban on, on LWAP sentences altogether. Um, I think I personally would lean towards an outright repeal of LWAP, but this seemed pretty close to me, maybe not. And certainly if it's supported by um, folks as, with as such strong law enforcement perspective as her, I was, I was, I was encouraged. So um, those are my thoughts. Professor Ochin. 
Uh, I, I agree with um, the recommendations that you laid out in terms of the ones that, that seem to surface and be um, you know, the most feasible. And I also think the, the wisest in terms of uh, what we discussed yesterday. I want to add to what you said uh, in, with regard to sentencing enhancements. There was some discussion about uh, limiting the ability of uh, uh, prosecutors and judges to stack uh, sentencing enhancements, which can increase um, sentences and in terms of the extreme sentences. And, and um, Mike, I think you sort of brought this out uh, in terms of your colloquy with the secretary of CDCR. Um, around the number of people who aren't technically serving um, life sentences, but they're serving ex, you know, extreme determinate sentences as a result of some, the operation of some of these sentencing enhancements. So I think paying particular attention to how sentencing enhancements are used and placing some limits on their ability to be stacked and, and, and so forth. Um, there were also some suggestions made about um, three strikes regarding, for example, sunsetting uh, or uh, limiting the ability of prior felony convictions to be used after a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. I think exploring that would be wise. I also want to call the committee's attention to the memorandum that was submitted by the California Coalition for Women Prisoners. Uh, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about uh, the concerns of women uh, yesterday, but we did hear, I think, some compelling testimony uh, from Ms. Susan Bustamante. And I just wanted to highlight something that uh, the CCWP said in their materials. One is that California has the highest proportion, and this is according to data from the sentencing project, has the highest proportion of women in prison serving a life sentence. That's one in four in the state of California as compared to one in seven in Louisiana, one in eight in places like Massachusetts. Um, and according to the, the testimony that was submitted by CCWP, much of this is driven by uh, how um, state law defines accomplice liability. And so I don't know if that is a part of this conversation. Obviously, it's my first meeting, so I'm still getting up to speed in terms of how we're addressing things like ex uh, uh, um, extreme sentences like LWAP when the theory that was pursued is an accomplice theory that uh, often applies in the context of uh, uh, women's um, convictions for these kinds of crimes and their sentencing. Um, so I, I just want to call the committee's attention to that particular suggestion, which we didn't explore, but perhaps our staff can look into going forward around potential changes to uh, standards for accomplice liability and the particular effects that they have on um, people in women's prisons in the state of California. Cer certainly we can do that. Um, I do want to try to get us back though to the conversation about LWAP and then we'll come to, to those in turn, but I, I definitely think those are appropriate and good for the research ideas. Uh, Justice Moreno, did you want to say something? Well, I was going to say something about the matters raised by uh, the professor. Well, I, I really want to try to keep. But, but, but wait, here's what I think about the the LWAP. Yes. I, I think, uh, and then we'll get we'll come to it. I just want to try to keep us focused. Right, no, I, I'm on point. I, I think I asked the the DA uh, about that. You know what what term under an LWAP sentence would she essentially agree? that you'd have a second look at an LWAP and I think her response was well, that becomes just like an ordinary life sentence. That's fine. Uh, so I, I think that uh, I'm, I'm for a second look on LWAP. You know, it might be a, a 20 year actual served or something like that. But if a look, a second look is not available for LWAP under the current scene, I would certainly favor uh, a, a second look on that type of sentence. You know, I'm, I'm firmly committed like others that there is an aging out process. <laughs> and uh, certainly uh, if you've served a lengthy sentence, you, 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 you more than deserve a second look to see, you know, how you've done in those 20, 20 years. And I think that criminality and recidivism really wanes significantly, drastically even, uh, with age. So uh, if that's what we're talking about, a second look at LWAP, I'd be all in favor of that. 
yeah, I, that's what that, that's what I'm suggesting that we, yeah. we consider. Um, now, the big distinction between a second look at LWAP versus eliminating LWAP. Eliminating yeah. LWAP would would say people with LWAP get a chance at parole, go to the parole board. Yeah, what she was suggest what, yeah. what she was suggesting is 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 slightly different. Well, or maybe significantly different, which is instead of going to the parole board, first you would go to a judge present mitigating evidence that perhaps wasn't presented at the time. She, as I recall, was non-committal about whether evidence of rehabilitation or whatnot would be relevant at such a hearing. But in any way, in any event, to go back yeah. uh, and determine whether or not, broadly speaking, the LWAP sentence from the judge's perspective remained appropriate, and then that could be converted to an indeterminate life term. Professor Ochin? Um, so let me just uh, underscore uh, some of the things that you said, because I, I don't, I think I sort of uh, endorsed them without being clear about okay. my position uh, in my zeal to talk about um, women's, uh, you know, how folks in women's prisons are affected. So I would be in favor of eliminating LWAP. Um, you know, I was very moved by the testimony. Um, I think it was Ms. Fedig at, at the, in, on the last panel uh, in the conversations about different models where there are caps on extreme sentences and whether that's realistic in terms of the legislature. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not optimistic, but I do think that that is a conversation that we should keep it uh, top of mind. So not only abolishing LWAP, but also thinking through uh, considerations around capping extreme sentences um, across the board. Um, so so I'm, I'm in agreement with you, um, Mike, with regard to, or uh, Chair Romano, with regard to um, abolishing LWAP, that would be my, my priority. Um, but I also uh, understand the, uh, the, the politics of the situation. Uh, and so well, with regard to what Justice Moreno um, suggested in terms of a second look or a, uh, uh, an opportunity to come before the parole board, which seems to me to be abolition of life without parole, uh, if you get an opportunity to come before the board periodically, um, I think that would be uh, uh, the, my sort of second, um, uh, um, my second position that I would endorse. What about coming before a judge? I'm curious to hear perhaps from Judge Espinoza. In my experience, judges are in some ways more open to reconsidering sentences than even the parole board after some period of time, especially if people have demonstrated change. Do you think this is appropriate? So my understanding of at least the proposal that we were discussing was that you'd come back for to a judge first to reevaluate the sentence rather than going to the parole board. Um, do you, does any do, do people have feelings on that? Well, if the thought is that you're going to go back before the judge that imposed the original sentence, that's not like to it's yeah. not going to happen because. First of all, it's it's more senior judges that are imposing those sentences and after two decades, they're likely in the wind. They've, they've retired or moved on. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think I think the results have been very mixed, for example, on Prop 36 resentencing, depending on who the judge is. Um, same with habeas on parole denials. It, it, it varies. So I don't know that you're going to get um, uh, consistency in outcomes appearing before a judge. But if it's not the final step, if it's an initial step, you go back to court and see if the court will reconsider the sentence and then maybe go, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I think it's you're better off with, the petitioner's better off with the parole board. As Peter said, the, the sentencing judge is gonna be long gone. Uh, and I think the, the critical factor is the performance uh, of the petitioner you know, while in prison, as opposed to revisiting the circumstance of the offense and, you know, factors in mitigation back when the offense occurred, that's going to be, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a habeas in a sense. Uh, and I think that would just be unduly, take up a lot of time. What are you going to dig up 20 years later? What are 15 years later? So the critical thing is that people change. They're not the same person they were when they're 20, 21. Uh, so 
uh, I think uh, the parole board is best equipped uh, to do that. I actually, I, I endorse certainly that the most relevant mm -hmm. question is, you know, are they safe to be released? Are they rehabilitated? Are they yeah. changed? Are there, yeah. um, and the parole board, that's certainly the parole board's traditional function. I will say with the experience with Prop 36 and, and what Judge uh, Espinoza was saying is that um, almost everybody, almost all people were granted relief at, when they went back to court um, with, with the exception of Los Angeles County. And that was all a special circumstance that we can discuss. Um, but if the recommendation is you go back to the, you go to the parole board, that's just eliminating, flat eliminating LWA. Yeah. You know, I, mean, I, I can tell you, I was on the, was it Rosencrantz and Dannenberg cases? I always had, I was very skeptical of judges, you know, making these types of decisions when we have a, a structure, the parole board to look at these things. So, and then the governor, you know, puts in his two cents, uh, which I think he should really defer to the parole board. So as the judges and governors, I think they should defer to the parole board. All right, well. Can, I, can I just ask a, just a factual question? I, I have um, had, a, I had an occasion to look at some of the statistics regarding uh, grants of parole for, for lifers um, some years ago, but uh, again, that was some years ago. Uh, parole board has changed, administration is different. And I'm wondering if, um, uh, if we have data on historical and sort of current uh, grant yeah. rates that, that we could look at. Yeah. We do. Uh, yeah. I'm going to misquote the, the data right now, so excuse me. <laughs> uh, but roughly speaking, um, of the people who choose to go before the parole board, I think we're close to 30 or 40 percent. Now, what that excludes is that there's a large percentage of people who feel they're going to be denied and voluntarily postpone or waive their parole hearing. So of the universe of people who are eligible for parole in any given year, I think we're closer to 16 or 18% grants. So depending on the way you count, um, Tom and or any of the staff want to weigh in, did I completely murder those numbers? A plus professor, yes, that, that, that's, that's right. And I also point out, of course, that you know even that 16, 18% rate is historically much, much higher than it was before um, the two most recent governors. So for a while on the chart, you know, it's barely um, inching up off the ground. And I also, while I'm, I'm, I'm here, I think I also want to speak a little bit about uh, Professor Seed had mentioned that BPH, the parole board, did have a regulation until the 90s where they would review LWAP sentences and refer them, I, I guess, for commutation. So that might be another way, though probably a little more hand-handed, but I think I found that very interesting that LWAP wasn't really truly LWAP until, um, you know, fairly recently. Okay, I, I do want to keep us moving. So I, I have a couple of things. First of all, the grant rate for Prop 36 cases, just because I'm particularly attached to it and Judge Espinoza raised it, is about 90%. And that's going back before a judge. So it's, it's, it's far higher than uh, the parole board. Um, with regard to the regulation that Tom is referring to where BPH can refer LWAP cases back, I still think that might be on the books. And I think that I'd like the um, staff to look into that. I also propose that we ask staff to um, look into other states that may have eliminated LWAP and what, how that came about um, and the numbers um, there. And I think that that's sort of the direction that we could should go for further uh, research, unless other people have ideas on this particular, again, with regard to LWA. That's fine. I, I have a question on your statistics, the 90% grant rate. Yeah. LA County was the outlier. What was the, do you know what the rate was in LA County? Well, part of the problem is that they're still ongoing in LA County. So it's, we're still counting. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll get it, I'll get it for you. It's still a vast majority. Okay, here comes Laura. She has the LA County. Oh, no, well, I was going to um, jump in and just address what other states have eliminated LWAP, and that's um, none. 
uh, there, there's LWAP in every state except for Alaska, and Alaska has long, long sentences, like 90 years to life, 150 years yeah. to life. So they're essentially LWAP uh, sentences. So uh, unfortunately, nobody has done that yet. Well, but see, we, but, they could be the I, first. I would like to. I I just want to push back on that a little bit because they think that there are a lot of several states that have that have LWAP on the books, but they're not fun. But they're actually not functionally LWAP because you can get referred down. You can get referred down. Um, I think that that came up a little bit yesterday. Anyway. Um, yeah, we'll we'll look more into it. But okay. um, on the books, it's everybody has it except Alaska. Okay. Alaska. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, just to keep us moving on the, so I think we're want to hear more about elimination of LWAP from the from from staff, some more uh, data, and um, especially the I'm particularly interested in the in the regulation issue that Tom raised. Um, so I sort of I sort of thought that that was still in the books. Yeah, you, know, you know, just I mean I think we would all agree that uh, eliminating it would be untenable in terms of getting that kind of legislation passed. It's often viewed as an alternative to the death penalty. Uh, so there would be a firestorm. Uh, I don't think it would pass. Well, you know, that's another thing that we should consider, I yeah. think, as a committee. And we're not ready to make recommendations. And yeah. I think as a committee, we have to consider, do we make recommendations that are aspirational, that we hope someday and move the, the yeah. needle? Or do we make recommendations that we think are politically feasible? Right. Um, so I think on the on the feasibility side, it's mm -hmm. closer to the proposal that we were discussing earlier about a judge second look, yeah. right? Which I actually think is not that different, especially given my experience in court. And you know, um, but I think that. If, if we had our magic wands, it sounds like we're all leaning towards more just eliminating straight. And of course, the confounding factor of the, the death penalty elimination, which we're gonna talk about later today, yeah. that yeah. complicates the matter even further. Mm -hmm. um, but I do wanna keep us moving because I don't think as far as details in the policy, we have further questions from staff, correct? Yeah. All right, um, the next, item that I have on, the, on my agenda is what we talked about was, and we didn't talk that much about it, but are the, are the long gun use enhancement, um, 10, the 1020 life rule. Um, and uh, I know that there's some proposal, at Assembly Member Lee, I don't know if you're uh, available, but I think that he's even the sponsor of a proposal to reduce the, gun enhancements. Again, we didn't talk a ton about it yesterday, so perhaps we just need further research. I don't know if people have thoughts about it. You know, there's also different ways to think about enhancements, right? We can tackle each one or discuss each one, or as Professor Ochin was suggesting, perhaps enhancements generally is a better approach. Um, so with regard to this, do people have particular thoughts or questions for staff? about the 10, 20 life rule. I don't remember which witness made the, um, made the recommendation. I think it may have been the gentleman from the public defender's office, but I like the idea of just capping, capping the, um, the use of a gun to a, a, a term that's more commensurate with the, the sentence on the underlying charge. So reduce just re still have just having having gun enhancements, but have them reduced. Yeah, I mean, I I don't want to get into a political feasibility conversation again, but I think the idea of just modifying the length of time would be um, an easier sell than than eliminating gun enhancements. I I I think that. I, I agree with that. I mean, I mean, one of the particular problems I think in California, as I mentioned a little bit yesterday, is we don't, of course, have an armed robbery statute. We have robbery and then gun enhancements that you know come on top of that. Um, I think um, 
Again, I guess more recent, we, especially because we didn't have much conversation about this yesterday, research from staff, I would be curious about how other states um, or proposals in California and how they're faring on how um, to, to reduce or perhaps eliminate gun enhancements. I mean, one could argue that gun enhancements um, are in the robbery context, I just want to say, are already um, encompassed in the aggravated term, right? An ordinary robbery would be aggravated if you had a gun, um, but perhaps not. All right, uh, unless anybody else has anything to say about the gun proposal? Yes, I yes, I do. Um, I think it was Mr. Aaron, um, who uh, in his submitted uh, testimony uh, provided some suggestions regarding the uh, gun enhancements. And one of the things that he suggested was uh, requiring certain kinds of evidentiary requirements uh, prior before a gun enhancement could be applied. For example, that the gun has to be uh, loaded, uh, invisible things of that nature. Um, so, you know, I, I understand the conversation about uh, perhaps eliminating um, this particular enhancement might not be politically feasible, and I'd be interested in hearing from Assemblymember Lee or Senator Skinner about um, that particular issue. But if there are, are ways in which evidentiary requirements can be utilized to uh, limit the use of gun enhancements to only those offenses where there is a real risk of harm, um, then I think that, that may be something that we should explore uh, along with the sort of general approach to uh, limiting how enhancements are used generally in terms of stacking their length, their relationship to the base offense uh, and so forth. Yeah. That's right. That's a detail that I admitted. I will say that um, our proposal, our recommendations from last year um, recommended that there be a presumption, merely a presumption, um, against gun enhancements if the gun was unloaded or inoperable. Um, so that's pending legislation. I believe that's correct, Tom, Laura, Rick? That's right. Yeah. So that's currently pending. Now that's merely a presumption. Um, so, you know, we could, we'll, we'll, we'll see where that goes. And it obviously could, you know, we could take it a step further and say, you know, no gun enhancements or, or, or reduced gun enhancements if, you know, unloaded or an inoperable weapon. Um, I think that makes sense as well. Okay, are there other uh, ideas or concerns that are, worth researching with regard to guns. You know, as with all of these things, I'm now I'm talking to staff, I don't want to ignore the public safety um, potential benefits of, of these statutes. Obviously that's their at least um, intended use and benefit. And, um, you know, uh, I think to the best that we can try to see whether or not these statutes have had um, any influence one way or another on public safety as they've been enacted. I, I'd be very curious if we can come up with that analysis. Um, next on my list is, and we sort of touched on this already, is was Ms. Fedek's suggestion of a, of a 20 year cap with an exception for civil commitment um, with periodic review. Um, I believe this is also, I may be incorrect. Um, it's not pending uh, legislation, unless I'm mistaken. Staff can jump in if I'm mistaken. But this is about, this is about aging out. This is about um, you know, giving everybody basically, um, I think it's, she would describe it as stronger than a second look because I think it would be a strong presumption for release and civil commitment approved by probably a, a court or jury um, rather than the parole board deciding that you, you stay in. Um, how do people think, what, what are people's reactions to this? Well, uh, as I said, um, I 
I think that's an idea that we should explore. Uh, I um, am in agreement about the data that was shared. Um, uh, you know, when we look at all these extreme sentences, the staff memo uh, is quite clear that the deterrent effect is negligible. Uh, the, the incapacitative effects in terms of removing people whom uh, societies deem danger, a danger to society is negligible after a certain, you know, I think it's questioned generally, but particularly after uh, two decades have passed, after people have sort of aged out of uh, th those sort of prime years, uh, as, as called in the literature. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the rationales for this kind of extreme punishment, you know, just doesn't, it's just not supported by the literature. Uh, and an approach uh, that Ms. Fettig described seems to better be aligned with a rational approach to addressing what is very serious harm with you know, the capacity of people to grow, change, rehabilitate, um, and, and become uh, productive members of, of their communities and to rejoin their, their families. This raises, I, I, I concur. Uh, it, it raises the question that we were back at the beginning of this conversation is, are courts the appropriate venue for making that civil commitment determination? I'd be interested in hearing from our, our colleagues that uh, have, have served. We're actually, we're actually judging. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm sure you can tell I'm pondering here. I have my hand on my forehead. Um, you know, I have some experience in managing the SVP calendar in Los Angeles County um, with civil commitments. Um, I just, I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. I, I suppose courts are the appropriate venue. So it certainly uh, comes along with, you know, a series of protections of, of a person's constitutional rights. So Judge Espinoza, perhaps you can just, I, I don't want to call on you an expert, but I'm going to. Uh, because I'm not. Go well, ahead. but you brought it up. My understanding is that we currently have a civil commitment scheme for sexually violent offenders and mentally disordered offenders, but you have to come back to court and then it's a jury trial, correct? Basically on danger, mental health and dangerousness. Is that correct? So I, I don't have any experience with the, the other, but I do with the SVP population and um, there's a definition of sexually violent predator. There are experts that will testify on both sides as to whether the person meets the criteria. And if they do, then the jury can rely on that testimony to either find, yes, the person does fit the definition uh, uh, of a sexually violent predator. My recollection, and again, this is a long time ago, 12 years or more, um, is it a determination that someone is, is an SVP can be revisited, right? Once yeah. an expert opines that the person no longer is an SVP and, and that has to do with a number of factors, including programming, which at the time nobody was doing because the evidence presented in the program or the, the, the information presented in the program could be evidence um, in an SVP trial. So most of the, the, the men up at, um, at the state hospital were not participating in the programming, um, but uh, I forgot where I was going with that. Anyways, yeah. yeah. And, and I think revisited. that Ms. Fettig was talking about being able to revisit the question periodically. Yes, yeah, like um, every two years, I think, isn't it? Yeah. S S SVP, I, yeah. SVP, I, I, I believe it is. And I also want to comment that, you know, the civil commitments are not far off, you know, civil is, um, a term of art, you know, it's, it's not far off from actual prison, in my opinion. Um, yeah, right. So it's a locked state hospital facility, if that's what you're referring to. Um, right. Well, it looks and feels a lot like a prison. Yeah. Yeah. There, there, I think, as I recall, in the, the state hospital is somewhere along I-5 or I-99. I, there are several, I think there are five or six of them. And oh, I thought there was yeah. just one. 
No, there's one, Napa. The main one for the SVPs are, um, it's in Colinga, Colinga yeah. State Hospital. That's Colinga. the one. Um, but a lot of those people are waiting. They've been, you know, waiting for a trial for like 10 and 12 and 15 years. Yeah. There have been yeah. some issues with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember um, I had a philosophy that no case could not, there, there was no case that couldn't be settled. And so I created a settlement program for the SVP cases for that very reason. Mm -hmm. We didn't settle any. Yeah, um, yeah. We just didn't settle any, and, and a lot of it had to do with the lack of programming. But what what I do remember is the opinions of the experts um, tended to change with age, right? As we talk about aging out, as some of these offenders became, you know, geriatric um, patients in the state hospital, it was easier to get a, a, an expert to opine that they were no longer um, SVP. Can I ask, last year, again, we recommended something similar where we said everybody who had served 15 years um, could petition a court to be basically resentenced. Um, how is this different? And I think that this is a bill that's currently pending. Well. I, I presume that Ms. Fedig and some others would want very strong presumptions in favor of release. I, I think our bill is, does not have those built in, but there is at least a second look after 15 years. Again, staff, correct me if I'm wrong, that's, that's a currently pending legislation, right? I think that the pending legislation on second look sen sentencing relates to 1170, uh, resentencing procedures that we discussed last year um, and not specifically to automatic second look after 15 years. I'm not talking about automatic. I, I agree that we didn't do automatic, but do, but our proposal at least allowed people to petition after 15 years. Certainly our proposal did. I'll have to double check if the legislation does that. I think what Ms. Fedick was suggesting is not, even, not a presumption, but an actual cap where once a person reaches the 20 cent, 20 year sentence, they are released unless the state meets the burden of proving that uh, they're too dangerous to release. Right. I, that's where I was saying about the burden and that it would be different. But I'm very curious, and if the staff could come back and report to whether or not the amendments that we suggested to 1170D, including the ability for petitioners to be able to petition for their own uh, release is, is pending in the legislature. And I will say that the federal um, um, First Step Act provides that certain federal prisoners can petition for their own uh, release after a certain period of time. So um, it wouldn't be so novel to do that. That isn't exactly the same as a 20 year cap in the civil commitment afterwards, but it's in that direction. So I guess if we could have an update on that legislation, um, that would be um, very helpful and how different that would be from the 20 year cap proposal that um, Ms. Fedick yeah. suggested. And one more thing is that Tom asked her what states have, if any, have enacted a second, a, a 20 year cap and she, threw out a, a handful of states that are doing a good job or not, but it wasn't clear to me which, if any, have actually enacted this legislation, so. I, I think she's talking about a second look, Mike. Um, okay, so not, a cap, of... not a cap, not a cap, a second look. Um, and she was pointing to DC, which I think is, is either looking at that or just recently enacted something around the, along the lines of a, a 20 year second look. Uh, one thing I did wanna add is that our bill does not um, have any impact on people serving LWOP. So it, it's, it's, you know, only people who are serving sentences uh, of, you know, lower than LWOP, but LWOP would not be included. So that's or, a huge yeah. difference. And death cases. Mm -hmm. Right, it, right, exactly. Right, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, all right, well, that's, that's, that's important. I just, I just think that the, the difference between a cap and a second look in my opinion, seems to be that it's um, about the, the strength of the presumption of release. 
right? Uh, maybe if somebody could, I think I, I think that that's what it is. And well, Mike, I think the, the one for me that is huge is that you don't have a right to counsel to ask for a second look. Whereas when you're being sentenced originally, um, you know you have a right to a lawyer, um, and a a cap is much more definitive than coming back years later on your own, hoping you get an attorney um, and the right judge to to grant it and do appeals. Whereas a cap is a, is a is a cap. So whether it's a good idea or not, I think those procedural differences, in my experience, ended up being quite significant because um, you're relying essentially on the incarcerated person doing self-help. Um, and you know, as you know from your experience, that you're it's a uh, that can be very difficult. All right. Well, that, that that's a good point. So let's try to first of all let's see what the update is on our legislation, whether or not it includes the our legislation. The recommendation that we had made, which our recommendation certainly was at 15 years, you get a chance to petition for court. I know it's not automatic, and you're right that it does not include a right to counsel. Um, but it, I'd be curious to see the, the distinction between sort of the model 20 year cap legislation, model second look, and what we've proposed. And I can give you a quick update on the legislative front. So AB 1245 has the uh, committee recommendation for the 15 year defendant initiated uh, second look. So that is um, currently in the legislature. And that's uh, assembly member Ting's bill. I don't, I think there's a separate one. Um, this is a hot topic right now. Uh, okay, I don't, I don't, I we don't need I think we don't need cool. to get into the weeds. <laughs> All right. Just, just a, a clarification, does the second look apply to determinate life and LWAP sentences? Uh, well, Justice Mourinho, I think this is going to get into the weeds immediately, uh, but the issue is what power the judge would have at a resentencing and some of those special circumstances, I think all of them, the judge can't dismiss under 1385.1. Whereas if it was a three strike sentence, for example, the strikes could be dismissed to fashion a lower sentence, but some of those more serious sentences, I think the relief would be a little bit more complicated to obtain. Okay. We should look into that too. I remember Natasha and I going back and forth about this, about 1170D and its applicability to death penalty. So I don't think that that's a fully settled right. issue, but let's get out of the weeds for a second. Um, anything else on the, on the cap? Any other research agenda uh, on the, cap that would be helpful as we continue to discuss these issues. Okay, um, moving on to uh, a proposal that I think is actually pretty elegant. Um, right now, um, as a result of Proposition 57, if you are in prison for a nonviolent crime, you have a chance, you have a, you have a right to parole review at the end of your base term. So basically not including enhancements. Before the enhancements kick in, you get a parole review. And this is what I was getting into with Secretary Allison about a paper review versus an actual full board review. Um, and before we get into the appropriateness of a paper review, I think it makes, um, a good deal of sense to expand that to everyone. I don't understand why, if you've conv convicted a nonviolent offense versus a violent offense, if you're safe to be released and we feel like enhancements are problematic, that you shouldn't get at least a parole look at the end of your base term. I, I agree. Um, I, I hope that we pursue that recommendation. I also think it's important to think about uh, even the discretion uh, that prosecutors have in terms of how conduct is framed as, as violent or nonviolent. And I think we heard testimony yesterday about, um, you know, uh, someone who steal something from a store and maybe gets into a, 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 you know, engages with a security guard and that's a violent offense, right? So, um, you know, I think because of the slippages between violent and nonviolent and the amount of discretion that prosecutors have in terms of framing conduct as violent or, or not, um, 
is another reason in addition to the to those that you stated uh, for the expansion of Proposition 57. The other thing that I like about it uh, is that um, it sort of calibrates when you would get a second. It doesn't, 20 years on, in the one hand, I mean, this is a, sort of a different issue, that's a cap. It's kind of an arbitrary number. We just pick 20 years and people age out and why 20 years and not 22 years or 25 years or whatever. But if you rely on the base term as when you get your look, it's kind of calibrated by the seriousness of your offense because more serious events have higher base terms. And without having to create a schedule or some kind of sentencing um, ladder or matrix, it, 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 all, it uses the base term that, that exists already in statute, which is why I sort of like um, the idea of using Prop, the Prop 57 model. It's already also, it's also something that's already in existence. I do have some concerns about the paper review aspect of it. Um, and I would love, uh, I, I, it's probably in, in um, Jennifer Schaefer's uh, report that she sent to us last year, Tom, Laura, Rick, but I would be curious about the grant rates um, from the- 20%. <laughs> 20%. 20%, so it's even higher than the actual. It's it's very close to the, close. to the life, you know, that the lifer rate fluctuates a little bit, but it's it's very close to it. That's really interesting. Okay. And, and, it's, the, and it's the same standard, meaning danger to society, unreasonable danger to society or whatever the non-standard is that is another That's issue right. altogether. That's right. And, and I just wanted to clarify something. Is it correct? Uh, is my understanding of, of the, and I'm, I've linked on the witness's name, that the secretary of CDCR um, noted that certain parts of Proposition 57 with regard to earned credits or good time credits has already been expanded. Yeah. Um, and she noted that there haven't been any um, particular um, public safety and negative public safety impacts uh, well, of that move. I think it's fairly new, right? I don't know if anybody's been released, but um, I, I just, I just want to note that it has been somewhat expanded already. Yes, it's extremely new, like as of last week. Ago. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. I didn't catch that piece. Okay. Yes. And I think it's important to clarify, Proposition 57 basically has two parts. Yes. One is about early parole release and the other is about um, credits. So it's very, I mean, it's, I, we're moving very quickly between both of these things. So the credit expansion, which is what um, Secretary Allison was talking about, they've expanded credits multiple times under Prop 57 since it passed. And this is just the most recent, and I think in many respects, the one of the, the bigger ones, but this isn't the first time they've expanded credits. So I think we do have some insight into the public safety effects. Um, but I think the proposal that the committee's talking about now is about the early parole release. Is that right, Mike? It's, no, it's yeah, that is. That I'm just noting that yeah. Proposition 57 has already been expanded beyond the initial population, uh, at least at, at, at this stage. Am I correct in understanding? That's my question. Am I correct in understanding part of Proposition 57 has been expanded? Exactly. Right. The, yes. part the, the percentage of credit time that you get has been expanded. Go ahead. And, and, and across, that's up to CDCR. The, the eligibility for parole is um, nonviolent is actually in the Constitution. So they don't really have much discretion around that. But on the credits, they have total discretion. So that's, um, it gets very complex about what has to be done by regulation, what would be, you know, have to be a law, things like that. But there are these, these two parts. And um, I think the discussion yesterday sometimes um, moved quickly between them <laughs> in a, you know, that, that's that's certainly true. What at least the proposal that I teed up, which is expanding Prop Fifty Seven parole right. beyond the nonviolent, that would require at minimum a statute. That couldn't just be done by mere regulation. Yes, I'm just trying to point out here that the effect of that regulatory move by CDCR is that people who otherwise did not qualify initially under Proposition 57 may be released earlier because of the effect of how these credits are being awarded. Is that right? Yes. Well, I don't, I don't think so. 
Well, well then, uh, then with that, then under the prior, so if it was at 20 something percent, right? Yeah. That would slow the pace of uh, their releases is, is I'm just trying to understand how these, this is a new area for me. I'm trying to understand these sure. credits work because the, the basic point to me seems to be that if that, if it is the case that, and I know we're talking about parole, I'm just trying to make the point that CDCR has seemed to suggest that they are not concerned that there will be uh, significant public safety effects if right. they have moved in this direction with this population. No, that, so to answer your first question, as best as I understand, Prop 57 did not expand the number of, the number of people who could get credits. It just increased the amount of credits that people right. get. Right. Now, um, with regard to what CDCR's perspective and what Secretary Allison, I think that she was saying for the general proposition, I don't want, I'm very hesitant to put words in her mouth because I know that she doesn't want to speak for the administration or whatnot, but that they have tremendous faith in the parole board and that giving hope and an opportunity for release um, earlier is a incentive towards rehabilitation that improves long-term public safety. Um, all right, so I think that a couple of questions arose around this Prop 57, expanding Prop 57, um, how it's currently implemented. I'm particularly curious in the paper review process, the grant rate that it's about the same is, is very you know interesting to me. Um, and um, I don't know those are, those are the big questions that, that I have for it. Um, again, because there's no base term for LWAPs and uh, death row, it would, would not have impact those. This would pretty much be for determinately sentenced people. Um, okay, um, moving on. So there's a conversation about three strikes. Right. Um, there was several proposals from eliminating it altogether, including the second strike provision, to um, washout periods. I know that there's also been proposals to say that juvenile strikes should not count. Um, other proposals, I'm not even sure if they were raised yesterday, strikes that were committed prior to enactment of the three strikes law. It's becoming less and less relevant. Um, maybe they shouldn't be considered uh, as strikes. Um, I wonder how people feel about that. Any or all yeah. of those? Yeah, I mean, I think, for example, the, uh, the washout and the juvenile priors, those are, are uh, facts that uh, judges would take into account under Romero, even before Romero, in striking a strike. I mean, I think we, in, when I was on the Superior Court, we had a whole matrix of things we could consider, make a record and then strike strike to strike. And here in Los Angeles, that was quite common in the criminal courts building. So I think a washout, you know, whatever the term is, and certainly juvenile prior should not be taken into account. And there might be some other things that along those lines that uh, should uh, reduce uh, strike allegations. Judge Espinoza? No, I was just gonna agree with uh, Justice Moreno. I think juvie strikes and uh, a, a washout period, certainly anything that resulted in a conviction before the creation of three strikes, which was I think in- 94. 94, yeah, yeah I was gonna say yeah. 94, but um, there can't be a, well, I, I don't know. There's probably still quite a few of those strikes floating around. Yeah. Um, I mean, the principle there, of course, is that you weren't really on notice when you committed that yeah. uh, crime, which um, I think seems to strike with fundament, some fundamental fairness issues. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Ochin. So I, um, I was very moved by um, Mr. Woods' testimony. Um, uh, in addition to the staff memorandum and the testimony of um, our other witnesses on that panel. Uh, and so I'm in favor of abolishing three strikes. 
um, uh, obviously steps to limit three strikes, I think the committee should investigate, but I think the goal should be abolition. Uh, if that means incremental steps to uh, demonstrate uh, that there aren't any ad that there aren't any adverse public safety uh, effects, um, then you know that's that's fine. But I think the ultimate goal should be abolition of three strikes. I particularly want to just highlight something that's in the staff report, um, the staff memorandum. Uh, which is of for those serving second strikes, which is where our discussion was emphasized yesterday. Uh, 70, so there are currently 75%. Um, uh, um, so there are currently about 19,000 people serving second strikes in the state of California, according to the staff memo. 75% are Black or Latino. That's, you know, that's there's a striking number to me uh, and it, it about almost half are black. So it's about 8,710 are black and uh, are in, in another, uh, so actually half is Latino um, and about, you know, sort of, you know, 30, 40, 35% are black. Um, and that's, that's quite significant. So I just uh, wanted to, to call that out in terms of the, the racial disparity. Um, and so for a number of different reasons, including the, again, just the basic public safety rationales don't seem to add up. The arbitrariness, um, the, uh, the lack of evidence that they, this actually promotes public safety or drives crime down uh, when we look at county variances. Um, and I, I, I take uh, Mr. Woods's point, which is we should look at individual culpability for individual crimes uh, rather than um, uh, sort of extending liability in perpetuity uh, with regard to three strikes. So abolition and limitation first as a priority and then secondarily limitation of its use. A quick question, uh, Mike, yeah. on, Go ahead. on uh, abolition. I mean, we're dealing with the referendum. Is that, this would just be a recommendation as opposed to what the legislature could do with the two thirds vote or? As with all, as with many of the things that we're considering today, it would require either a ballot measure or a two thirds vote. Okay, so two thirds. Uh, the other factor I think that would come up would be, I forget what the section is now, is it 654, Peter? You know, sometimes someone would have two strikes because they had two robberies in the same incident. I remember right. saying that and you shouldn't be able, that should count as one strike uh, going forward. There, there's some recent case law on that, um, yeah. but I, I think that yeah, one case that makes sense too. I just want to echo a couple of things that Professor Ochin said, and just give a little bit more context to somebody who's dedicated their lives to the three strikes law. So um, first of all, I think it's important or interesting. I've always found interesting that uh, it was originally called the street sweeper law. Um, that was their original moniker for it, um, which. Uh, in some ways, I think reveals its intent and um, is a lot um, has a lot more punitive and different. Is a completely different metaphor, of course, than than three strikes. But that was their original moniker. It also disproportionately applies to people. It was sold as to keep the most serious and violent. You know, the, the ballot measure itself right. said murder, keep murderers, uh, rapists, and child molesters behind bars where they belong. Now, right. of course. Um, it disproportionately affects people who commit lower level crimes for the mere fact that uh, if you've committed a crime, gone to prison and gotten out again, you could only get out a couple times if those crimes were relatively minor. If you commit a very serious crime along the way, you're generally in for a very long period of time and don't have the opportunity to get out and commit a, a new crime, not just aging out, but just you just don't have the time. So it really disproportionately impacts um, crimes of poverty, um, which is a lot of the reasons why you see um, the racial impact, uh, mental illness, and uh, addiction. I will just say that it's particularly stark amongst Black defendants. Um, yesterday we discussed, or it came up, that in California, um, the general population is somewhere around 7% Black. Um, the prison population is somewhere around 25% black, and then the three striker population is 
45% black. So it really um, jumps up there. And especially when you're considering that these are largely crimes of poverty and not the crimes of rape, murder, and child molestation for which the law was originally passed. Um, so I, I join for all those reasons, I, I also think. And then I wanna just mention one last thing as a practical, re, a practical matter, there are already on the books fairly harsh recidivist sentencing laws. So for example, a three striker with current recidivist uh, pro, uh, on the books would get typically a 10 year enhancement on top of whatever their base term would be. Right. So if you were committed a robbery as your third strike and even the type of robbery that you were discussing, Professor Ochin, you know, a shoplifting where you, you would get, you could get uh, up to five years for the base term of the robbery plus 10 years for your two prior strikes. And many times these people have several prior strikes. So it could be even more, 15, 20 years. Um, but so, but at minimum 15 years, um, which is a significant sentence, a 15 year determinant sentence in the first place. And for the second strikers, this is something that I was trying to get at, but again, the math got complicated. You get one five year prior if you have a serious or violent prior felony, um, which then, so, so it's five years plus your base term. And so I guess the question is, is that, and I, and I think the answer is yes, is that sufficient additional punishment for, recidiv for recidivism? I, I think cer certainly so. Um, five years for each prior serious or violent uh, felony. Um, I, I, that's probably even too harsh from a pure public safety perspective. Um, but that, that's what would, if we just took three strikes off the books, that's what the recidivist scheme that would remain. Uh, could Which is still that? quite significant, right? As, <laughs> as, as, I, as, I, as, I, as I said, I will also say that three strikes, um, Mike Reynolds was correct that three strikes has been enacted in many states throughout the country. None have been used nearly as, often or apply to nearly as many crimes as California's three strikes law. So um, they're all quite different, but California's is definitely the broadest. And, and can I just say with regard to, to that testimony, um, when, when you know, folks or, or tell you who they are, you should believe them. And this law is racist and it should be repealed. Do people have other thoughts about three strikes? Is it worth the committee uh, continuing? Well, Mike, a couple of questions. Sure, of course. Welcome, say, Senator Skinner. When you say that other states, is it that their the language of their statute is significantly different than California's? Yes. Okay. So um, now, when we talk about repeal, because it was a ballot initiative. It requires either a two thirds vote of the legislature or putting it back on the ballot. And I think, well, I think a two thirds vote is a hard thing to get. It's a hard thing to get no matter on any bill. And a ballot measure, I mean, the, these are, are also hard conversations, but, uh, and maybe we don't need to have it now, but when you have an individual like who testified and who was obviously still very attached to three strikes. That narrative, you know, that he'll, the narrative will have a lot of money behind it. And it, it's a hard ballot measure to, to succeed with. Um, and of course, the other uh, risk we always face and, and please don't, I don't wanna be misunderstood. It, I mean, I think three strikes is one of the worst things that California has enacted. However, we also don't wanna invite new initiatives by such proponents that are even worse, but maybe we have the ability to stop those. But anyway, it's... So I think that, 
I don't want to get too into it at, at this point because I don't think that we're making a committee recommendation. Uh, Senator Skinner, you missed, I, I, I sort of touched on this a little bit earlier. First of all, we were already considering uh, LWAP sentences, which would also require a ballot measure is my understanding. And I think that we as a committee have to decide, um, do we take positions that we know are politically very long, long shots, but for the purpose of, of staking out a position um, and or, and, I, and I, you know, maybe it's not an either or, maybe it's and or, um, proposals that um, have a more realistic chance at enactment and get us part of the way there. So for example, last year, one of our recommendations was to strengthen or amend judges authority to strike strikes under 1385, which would curtail three strike sentences, um, and, but, not, but certainly not eliminate them. So I think that that's something that as we, as a committee wind throughout the year is where on the political, do we wanna consider politics at all? We could say politics are completely irrelevant. We are making proposals based on what we think are the best interests of California and public safety and fairness and justice, full stop. Well, or we could take into consideration the political realities. That well, what I would doing. recommend is that we first and foremost, before we, I mean, I obviously, went into a little bit the political reality. So, you know, I will own that. <laughs> However, I think that we first and foremost explore and use our staff capacities to look at what are all the options to affect it. And, and then we can either adopt all of them, right? But, or we can talk about their relative value or not value or ability to succeed or inability to succeed later. But I think it is worth it to explore all the different options we might have available to us in terms of revisions to the penal code that could address these core, the core things that we're seeing as problematic. I agree wholeheartedly. So I would say for our committee, for our assignment to staff is precisely what Senator Skinner said. From elimination, what are the different ways uh, down from that to uh, curtail the harshest aspects of the three strikes law, including what we were talking about, washout periods, juveniles, um, strikes that were committed prior to the enactment of the three strikes law, perhaps greater discretion in dismissing um, strikes. I would also say that one of the things that we can and should do as a committee is lift up and talk more about the second strike proposal, a provision which is so much vaster in its application, and I believe is unique to California, which is the doubling of the sentences, and accounts for about 25% of the entire prison population. So 25% of the prison population is serving a, a doubled up sentence under three strikes. Um, but that should be, I think, maybe of special attention to this, this committee. And I think it's kind of the, the lesser known ver part of the three strikes law, because it's just two strikes, um, but has a much, much wider impact in terms of the number of people uh, involved, so. The other thing I'd like to, this isn't exactly on this topic, but we heard from Secretary Allison and she talked about the issues around 1170D, is that correct? Yep. Um, and that even with um, CDCR's vetting of folks that and the, that the statute as written is not resulting in, in, uh, in the type of outcomes that say the legislature or even CDCR might have anticipated. So it would be great to have staff give us some different options for how that might be modified. I believe we, one of our recommendations is a modification to 1170D that would uh, encourage but it, this is a big problem. And part of it is a problem that I think is solvable perhaps just by our bully pulpit. So many of these cases are just languishing in courts because courts, public defenders, prosecutors don't really even know what to do with it. But it's also because of the way the statute's written. So I really think it's worth it to have staff give us a number of options. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I'm saying that we, I think we already have a proposal and let's get an update on that certainly. Um, but I, I, 
there are hundreds and hundreds of cases that are just sitting there. Um, and those cases at minimum need to be ad addressed. Professor Ochin. I just had a, a question about um, the what the staff memo calls sort of the aging population of uh, three strikers and their eligibility under sort of uh, reviews that are based on age uh, in terms of, of release. And I, I just, I don't know the answer to that question. Are, are folks who are serving second, uh, second or third strikes who are over the age of 50, um, are there opportunities for review for release uh, based on their age or, um, or not? I, 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 I don't know and I, I'd be interested to know. So my understanding is as follows. Um, well, Senator Skinner, why don't you go ahead? I uh, think I'm the author of almost every statute in that regard. Um, you, are, you are indeed. Um, it's very similar to our 1170D problem. The way the statute is constructed, it, um, even though there's broad eligibility for now, people 50 and above, it used to be 65. Right. Um, broad eligibility for the recommendation to have elderly parole. There are very few for which it has occurred. And part of it is either when it gets sent to the court, the court not acting or the court rejecting. And, the, and when it gets sent to the court, of course, the DAs can then get involved Victims can get involved, various other, you know, there's some value, not some, there's in the concept of it, obviously value in that construction, but it has not resulted, when I think about the length of time that we have had, for example, elderly parole, um, that was first, uh, I think we first adopted it back in 2010, there's really been very, very few people, and is similar under the medical parole. Um, it's a it's a different step, but similar. And to answer your question directly, uh, Professor Ochin, it doesn't apply very much to three strikers because you have to have served 25 years and be 50 years old. And most three strikers- I think we changed it to 20 in the last- Okay, so might be 20, but three strikers generally are served 25 to life. So their, their impact is not, they're already getting parole for the most part at 25 years. Now, a lot of people are getting 50 to life under three strikes law and 75 to life under three strikes law. Then once you have served 20 or 25 years and are 50 years old, you do get a chance to go uh, to the parole board. It's still the same though grant rate. Like we still have this very low grant rate at the parole board, um, or in my opinion, very low, you know, 16 to 18%. Um, which is a, another issue that we addressed in our recommendations is to create presumptions in the parole standard in order to create some, and number one, clear, uh, clear transparency and clarity as to what the parole standard is, because I think it's quite opaque. Um, and then also encourage more grants um, for people who are safe to be released. Um, I want to move on from, I think we're left at the, the at, towards the end of the recommendation or the priorities for three strikes to the committee, I mean, excuse me, to the committee staff are from elimination to the various ways that it might be uh, further uh, amended, fully realizing that many, if not most of those would require a two thirds vote. I think it would be interesting to flag those that don't for example, the 1385 reform that we had proposed last um, year. Any other issues about three strikes and second strikes? Yes, I, I just wanted to follow up on that elderly parole question. Sure. Um, and, and perhaps this is to you, Senator Skinner, is, is there uh, interest or is this an area that perhaps the committee should look at in terms of where the you know, the caps are in terms of the amount of time that people have to serve before they're eligible for elder parole so that it, as you said, sort of expands the universe, even though obviously we're talking about these low grant rates, but at least in terms of eligibility to better capture the dynamics with regard to second and third strikes. Um, I'm, I'm just now texting uh, my staff to give me the answer on the, whether we did 15 or 20. Um, uh, 
there were, as there always, almost always is, exclusions. So there were some categories of crime that were excluded. So if you're a second or third striker who was in one of those categories of crime, you wouldn't be eligible the way it was written. That's um, it would require a two thirds vote, that's why. Correct. And, um, uh, but it, it otherwise, it didn't exclude second strikers per se, just certain categories of crime. Uh, a Prop 57 expansion, as we were discussing, would accomplish essentially what you're saying, Professor Ochin, right? Because then you get your parole look at the end of your base term, regardless of what your second or third strike sentence might be. So that would apply. One of the other reasons why I think it's a clever fix is because it applies second strikers, third strikers, all enhancements, right? We don't need to single out which enhancement it might particularly uh, apply to. Well, and th this is relevant, but a little different, but Secretary Allison also referred to yesterday that they changed their, so Prop um, 53, uh, was 53 the one that did the credits, the whole program? 57. 57, so they're both 50, oh, 40, 57, 50, okay. Yes. So, so the Prop 57, uh, was very, um, very, mm, uh, did not, uh, had few restrictions on who could qualify for credits, but left it to CDCR to develop regs. And the first set of regulations excluded many of the people that we, many of the categories of, of sentences that we have been talking about, but the, um, the department just updated those regulations and gave many more of those uh, of folks who are, for example, second strikers and different sentence types and crime types, the ability to get credits. So you may see right now in the media, there's been, there's sort of a, there's a, uh, it's quite inaccurate, but there's this discussion that 73,000 inmates will be released as a result of this change when in fact, it just means that those a, cat, a broader category of people can get credit for their participation in these programs. They of course still must go before the parole board. Those credits do not, are not an automatic release and they still have to be determined as suitable by the parole board. So there is no automatic release of this type of number that is now being tossed around in the press. Yeah, by I, opponents I, by the opponents. I, yeah, I think I think it's worth that. I think that I'm going to clarify that as well because it's something I've looked at a lot. But John Cox, you know, uh, specifically said that you know sixty something thousand people will be released of that. Um, first of all, that is true, Senator Skinner. That the most serious crimes uh, all have to go before the parole board, regardless. Also, with, as with all of the credit changes in CDCR, for better or worse, and I, I feel I've you know. They, these credits apply prospective only. Right. So for the 60,000, the people who are currently incarcerated, the new credits only apply to their future pre prison sentence. If they've already, they don't get these extra credits for the five, 10, 20 years that they may have already served. It, they, it's a different credit scheme, just so we're all clear on the reality there. Um, and of course, the whole point is to incentivize uh, better behavior in prison, more rehabilitation and long-term public safety, which is, I think, you know, everyone's goal. All right, I, I do wanna keep us moving. Um, we didn't have a ton of conversation about hate crimes, but I do think that they're also in the news lately and worthy of um, consideration. I mean, the proposals from our witness had nothing to do with the penal code. They all seemed very reasonable to me um, beyond our jurisdiction. Um, I think that it's refreshing that um, folks are not, you know, always seeking uh, increased punishments in order to, to deal with, you know, some very serious uh, social problems. So uh, I, I, that's all I have to say about this particular issue right now. Anybody? All right. 
Um, the, the final issues on my uh, agenda um, on the ideas were, were brought up by uh, Professor Ochin. So um, we did briefly talk about the phenomenon of stacking, the old rule of double the midterm. Um, there's proposals in the staff memo about maybe just pick one enhancement. We have so many enhancements that can apply, other ways to limit enhancements. Um, and perhaps those all should be uh, fleshed out. I don't know, Professor Ochin, if there's more on that that you wanted staff, but, but I don't wanna drop that issue either. I think the stacking problem is particularly um, hard and, and pernicious and um, all the different enhancements that you can get for the same activity, um, as, you know, and, and you know, in some ways it brings us back to three strikes. You get an, you get a five-year enhancer for having a prior. You, you know, your 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 fundamental crime can be enhanced because you have a prior. You can get an aggravated term because you have a prior. You get a five-year uh, enhancement because of your prior, and you can get a three-strike sentence because of a prior. And if you use the gun, you get that on top of that. And if it was a gang involved, you get on that on top of that. And if there was great, you know, it just is, it's all built. It's just, it seems to be double, triple and quadruple counting in many circumstances. So maybe if those could be fleshed out a little bit by the committee that uh, staff, that would be helpful. And then the last thing that uh, uh, Professor Ochin brought up, and, and I would love to see more research on this is, why are there so many more women in California serving life sentences compared to other states? Um, there was the suggestion that it's a result of uh, accomplice liability. I, I presume other states have accomplice liability, but what, so what's going on uh, in California um, if, if we are such, a, such an outlier as it, as it appears to be? Um, and what can and should be done about that? Uh, Professor Ocean, since you raised it, do you have any other thoughts about that? Um, I think I would also like to, to for us to look at theories around failure to protect um, and um, how, for example, um, individuals who are obviously being, a, you know, there are a number of women um, or people in women's prisons who have been abused or were abused by partners who may have killed children. Um, or they, they may have killed their partner. Uh, it, but, but I'm speaking here particularly with regard to failure to protect children. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm interested in exploring further how um, life without parole uh, is uh, affected by that particular theory in the context of uh, children who are killed and the um, uh, in most cases women, but not, not everyone in California women's prison identifies as a woman, uh, but generally women um, are being held accountable for homicides of their children by an abusive partner. And so I'd be interested in looking at those dynamics, failure to protect uh, um, uh, and other theories of accomplice oh. liability. Oh, I see. I, 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 it was, I, I got, that makes sense to me. Um, all right. Do other folks have We've been going for a while now. Uh, I want to. We have public comment comment coming up next. Um, we covered a lot of territory just now. This is a rehash of yesterday and a focus. The, the point of this conversation was to focus our thinking and staff research as we move down the calendar year towards recommendations uh, at the end of the year. So I think that we've you know given them quite a bit of work. Thank you all. Um, are there is there is there additional thoughts, research topics from yesterday that uh, anybody would would like further discussion or thought about? Obviously, we'll have time to come back to staff. I, th I think uh, it's also uh, perfectly appropriate for any uh, committee member to reach out directly to staff. If you have um, particular questions, I don't think that that's any uh, concern of Open Meeting Act rules. Brian, feel free to jump in if I just made a mistake there. But I, as long as we're not acting as a group, um, certainly you can communicate directly with staff and they've been spectacular. I talk with them multiple times a day as they well know. Um, so um, I'd like to take a, um, 
a 10 minute break and then we'll have a uh, public comment depending on how many people uh, uh, sign up for public comment. We'll see how long that goes. At the end of public comment, um, we will have um, a committee vote uh, on our conversation and deliberation about the death penalty. Um, unless anybody has anything last minute comments, I'm going to say we'll be adjourned or we'll take a break to, um, why don't we call it, uh, 250, 250. How late are we gonna go, uh, Mike? I know just approximate, I have another meeting at 4.30. Um, we may go a little bit later than that. It depends on how long public comment is and how long our conversation about the death penalty is. But um, we, you know, we're, we're obligated and, and, and want to, of course, have public comment and we can't take the vote on the death penalty or any votes until we've had public comment. So um, that's why we're doing in that sequence today. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone.